All right. You ready? I jump into this thing. I'm about as ready as I'm going to be. All right. Well, ready or not, here we go. (laughs) Welcome to the Inside the Box podcast, brought to you by Black Box Investigations and Appen Media Group. Dive into local issues important to the North Atlanta community, from politics and education to business and crime. Hear the story behind the story that you won't hear, read, or see anywhere else. Hello and welcome to another installment of the Inside the Box podcast. I'm your host, Hans Zappen, and joining me on the show this week is Alpharetta City Councilman Jason Binder. We talk about his involvement in the community since moving here from Texas in the early 2000s, and then we jump into some of the more talked about political issues before City Council in the recent past and on their plates right now. If you're interested in how the sausage is made in local politics, I think you'll enjoy the show. Here it is. Councilman Jason Binder, thank you for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me. Let's jump straight into it. I want to hear about uh, your story getting involved in Alpharetta City Council. So you first ran for City Council in 2015. Correct. Initially, you did draw some competition for that seat. I don't want to get into the the details of why you ultimately didn't have competition for that seat, but talk to us a little bit about your background in the Alpharetta community, and just generally speaking, what made you ultimately decide you wanted to run for Alpharetta City Council? So going back a little bit further from that, I've I've moved around quite a bit as a, as a kid, so about every five to eight years, um, moving around the U.S. and uh, My mom was always really good about getting involved in the community that you're in and making your community your home. And so I had I had that background of knowing in there when we moved to Georgia from Texas, we were moving as a a couple, Nicolette and I, as a couple that we, we got married in 2007, started grad school, bought a house and got married. And three years later, 2010, the deal was is after we finished grad school, we moved to Georgia because she worked at Newell. Okay. And, um, and that would be the place where we would start growing a family. And so I took very seriously. If anybody knows me, I like to do my research and have graphs and charts and everything. And I'm sure you're going to ask me questions about that <laughs> later on different different subjects. But I created one on you know which which city would be the best. And she wanted to probably to live more in town at the time, and and I I didn't want that, and thought North Fulton would be it, and pegged Alpharetta as the best place to grow a family. And that's because there's a lot of people like us moving in. Um, love the the connection between history and and uh, the bustle of uh, having a great commercial district that we could find jobs for. That was important. That I wanted a place that we could live long term. And so, as jobs changed or happened, it would be you know we could be close to home. So that's I moved in 2010, and Cecilia was born right there in October. Your and firstborn. My firstborn. Yeah. And started Rotary in 2011 as a place to get community. I thought it was important to show that community service was part part of uh, being part of a community and wanted to have it at the very beginning uh, with Cecilia as we were growing a family. So that's kind of how I, I got involved in there. And then you, you came shortly shortly thereafter. Mm-hmm. I, I dragged you in <laughs> and really, really, en- really so, enjoyed that group. So Jason and I are, are both members of the Alfreda Rotary Club. And uh, Jason is my sponsor. So every member has to have a sponsor to join the club. So Jason sponsored me. I guess that was 2012. Yeah, yeah. So and I know Rotary has been a big part of your life. Yes. Both as far as your public service but also as far as your network of friends and colleagues and people that you can rely on for both personal and business advice. Well, and I I use it more for the personal. I as I was moving there, we don't have any family, so that Rotary Club's my family away from family, and I I don't know where I would be with without them. Um, so a lot of them have taken me, you know, by the shoulder and, and helped helped us out and given given us a, kind of a hometown feel to it. And and I've I've really enjoyed I've enjoyed growing with it. Uh, I just finished presidency, I guess June last June, right? Yeah, so it's already been close to a year. Um, but that was between city council us having a third kid and uh 
and Rotary you skip, president. You that skip was my number third. two. Well, that was my, my <laughs> Where favorite was number part. Number two and all that. Number two is like a whole podcast on the, on herself. She's she's pretty she's uh-huh. pretty interesting. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, but so um, you've got your handful. You got a uh, you got three kids right now. We have three kids. So, okay. um, going back to the election of why why I ran, I I wanted the opportunity to have grow my children's hometown to something that they would want to be something that had a piece of me um that i had growing up i grew up in a town that was five thousand in a, the village of washingtonville in new york mm-hmm. and you'd be able to walk to everything and and uh just really enjoyed that experience so i wanted to have that kind of small town connection in there and i thought now would be a good time an opportunity to uh, to see what i could do to help out there and that one yeah that one's fun too because we we decided to run run for uh council and then um we had maggie i think like a year a year before she was only a year in those pictures this year number two that's number okay. yeah that's daughter number two so um it's been it's been a crazy crazy seven years but so what ultimately made you make that leap from i think it's safe to say a community leader beyond an elected official position to saying, okay, now it's time for me to take that leap and give a shot at elected politics. Well, that's a, that's a great point. So I was appointed to the design review board. And so I got a little bit of the governance there of, of serving and really enjoyed seeing there and seeing what was down the pipeline. DRB is pretty interesting because unlike planning commission, it's all the things that have been approved or maybe haven't been approved that they, they automatically happen because that's within the zoning, mm-hmm. but there's a design standard during, in certain corridors. So I was able to have a, a see what was going on and how things were growing and get a little bit closer to those details. And So, so DRB, Design Review Board. Yep. Talk to us a little bit about what you do on Design Review Board. They approve the designs for, for certain certain applications and corridors within Alpharetta. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the stuff that you see in Windward, Highway 9, Old Milton, and uh, so things there that's big corridors of influences. And what we would have to see is landscape, site plans, the ev- uh, elevations, what those would look like. And so I was a little out of my realm on that one as a as a finance guy in there and just, just try to be common sense on, you know, making sure that we wanted to look nice, you know, have the standard of Alpharetta, mm-hmm. but not be too much of a burden on the, on the owners, on the developers for it. So it was, it was a good, it was a good way to see how you really have to balance the decision-making, but then also how you have to go back to the, what's the documents within the city of what's allowed and not allowed. And, you know, you may disagree on the opinion of what they want to have, but it's within the realm of those rules. So it was a good, it was a good lesson there for, for a couple of years. So that was your, fir- kind of your first, uh, I guess that was your experience. first, yeah, that was your first exposure <laughs> into sort of government politics because you're appointed to that position, but I'm sure there's plenty of politics involved in being a member of the DRB and, and figuring things out there. What, what experiences did you have? What did you, what were any of the lessons learned you had as a member of DRB? Always, always do your homework. Talk to staff if you don't know. And, um, just if you have a good basis for your decision, then, then it's okay. And a lot of it, a lot of it is you're analyzing what you're reading and you're coming to an opinion from it. A lot of it's in, it's in that area that there is no black or white that you got to give from your perspective. How do you feel on it? And so, and then you're working with other board members that have different opinions and they come to a different conclusion and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's how it should be. So I really enjoyed it. That design review board, they're still a great group. I enjoy going and seeing them and they're, they're a lot of fun and they take their jobs seriously, but they, they have a lot of camaraderie amongst, amongst each other. So um, what's good there is that since it's kind of post approval process, it's not really politicized too much. I, we, we, we haven't had any hard things that were being looked at. Um, a good example is Avalon. We had, we spent six months having two mm-hmm. meetings a month going through the designs and making sure that the design matched what was promised to council and planning commission. But it was a lot of the, the heat was already taken there. So now it was just on the execution. So you're more working on details than process per se. On on that specifically, probably so. And a lot of it, and it's a good point too of what we see now is making sure that conceptual design stays as true as it can be. 
to what was promised to the citizens, to the city council members, to the planning commissioners. And and then if there's any deviation, kind of understand why. And sometimes that's okay, but making sure that the, the I'm sorry, the end architect design that they're submitting matches the conceptual design of what they kind of committed to on paper to the different commissioners or council members. So would you say that there are parallels between your time on DRB and your time now on city council? Oh, most definitely. I, I think that that idea of trying to stay true to the conceptual design, that works out a lot of our comprehensive planning. A lot of what you're seeing on um, the North Point LCI is a great current example. That That's a beautiful plan, conceptual design of what we would like to, to see. And I believe that since that was worked on with the citizens, the staff, and the and the developers, their opinion, that's a great place to move forward and that we should probably keep it to that conceptual design as much as possible when we execute on it. Okay. My main point starting off of why I decided to get to run run was what I saw on City Center. So City Center for me, um, we, we saw what, what there was for uh, the bond, and it was a conceptual plan and understand things change. But what I saw approved, I, I, I understood, you know, things need to be changed. But I was like, that really got me going. I was like, it'd be nice to be in that room to see how things got done. And if I could bring a different perspective in there, that we could have had something maybe a little bit closer to what I thought was a conceptual design. So there was no, you know, I would do it different. It was like, I, I would like to be in the room to see how it gets done and how I can change things. And that's maybe you can see some of the decisions that we had, whether the parking deck or, or other things that I really try to bring in there, maybe bring another thought of how we can get things done. Um, so that happened, I think that happened in May or so. And I, I really started running mid summer on that and really enjoyed that. We, my wife's, her favorite part was Nick Letts was, uh, building that float for old soldiers day. <laughs> yeah. So we loved doing that. And the yeah. kids really had fun getting involved with it. And it was a good, a good family outing on there. And then, uh, so we, we were, we were, I think we were running for two months prior to, mm-hmm. um, the, when, when everybody had to sign up. So the bond money for city center was approved in November of 2011, I believe. And you ran for city council in 2015. So there was a four-year period where there were some things that you disagreed with as far as process and end result. I think the city center one for me was, you know, I, I, I think it's now worth my time going in, even though our family is really busy, and seeing how I can, I can help be part of the process mm-hmm. in there and, and have a go at it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that, that, was, that was really it. And, and also just really enjoying working with staff as part of the DRB and just meeting everybody, too, that it was good. Um, wanted to bring balance to make sure that it was balanced growth, helping, helping businesses thrive in Alpharetta, but also catching up with our quality of life. We, we had such great growth during that period of, you know, post-recession, 2010, 2000, 2015. That was fantastic. But I think other issues, quality of life issues needed to catch up. Park space per 1,000 uh, residents, that needed to catch up. I believe that was below. I really think we should have had a way to get home quicker to, from work to our families, be able to unplug, be able to leave our neighborhoods by walking safely to something that was 10 minutes away with, with park space. I, I think I, I was going to be able to push some of those things and actually was able to do it pretty quickly with that, that new park bond that came in during the December 2015. We talked about it a lot, and then I think in February approved it. So that was a lot of the motivation for your running for city council. But in an August 2016 city council meeting, you were the lone dissenting vote on the site selection of a parking deck in downtown Alpharetta. Talk to us a little bit about what happened after that meeting. <laughs> um, that one, we, we, were, we, we spoke about it quite a bit. And uh, I didn't come, same thing, like I was talking about DRB, I didn't come to the same conclusion. And although they, it was said that we were voting on it because it was, um, I think, a more economical solution or it would cost us less, but really... Uh, the price per a new parking spot was actually quite a bit more, and we wouldn't be getting that many more parking spots for it. Um, so for me, on a fiscally conservative side, I didn't like it. 
also from the comprehensive planning side, again, going to that document. And so when I mentioned comprehensive plan, um, that's, that's a document that's been worked on by the stakeholders of Alpharetta, the staff, the citizens, the, the developers on there of how, what it should look like. And it mentioned that a parking deck would be needed on the west side. However, away from, um, help me out, Roswell Street mm-hmm. would be better to the west of Roswell Street. And because that would help make sure that the walkability was preserved and that a parking deck wasn't in the center of the western historic district of, of downtown. And so for me, it just it, it didn't work serve well for a walkable downtown that I'd like to see. And yeah, that night wasn't fun. That was I was the lone dissent vo- the vote. Um, and it's a six one vote, six one vote. But um, I just. But it wasn't a dead issue after that. It, it was. <laughs> so what happened after that meeting that led the city to revisit that after it it had already been voted on? I think looking back, we should we should have done a little bit more um, like we've done with the charrettes of seeing what we should do more public input on the parking deck options and seeing there. Uh, so what basically is we had to flip it backwards because there was more community outpouring on there of that. Hey, I I too would like it on on the west of on Milton Avenue west of Roswell Street. I and I commend the council on this is that we we looked it back and said, "Okay, let's let's take it upon further review." And we did that for quite some time. I can't even remember how how many times, but I think February yep. February was when we finally decided that it would go on the west side of of Roswell Street. So you were the the one person that voted no, but ultimately what happened is you were certainly not the only person in the community who felt the same way. You were hearing from a lot of folks who said, I'm glad you said that. Uh, I feel the same way. I wish I could have an opportunity to speak on that and say a few words about that and agree with you. Correct. And then it also gave us an opportunity to do the financials more on it and then show that truly it was a more economic decision to put it on the west side of uh, Roswell Street. Right. So uh, that overall, I'm glad I'm glad how, how it worked out. And then I think as a council, we, we started learning how to talk to each other a little bit more and, and uh, work together. And that that's really the best environment is a collaborative environment there. I think some of the best projects that we've had is, is the ones where it's collaborative, but also get the public input as much as possible in there. And that's like Ruck, the Rucker Road project. You know, that took a little while, but I think it's going to be a good, it's going to be a good project and good execution. And we're going to have something that we really enjoy. So that one, that one for me, it was it was a learning experience as a, as a council member how to get things done. And I'm I'm overall happy with the end conclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we could have all done you know something a little bit easier to have have communication uh, to discuss it more going forward. And it seems like that was the issue that established you as someone on council who was not going to be okay with the status quo and was not going to be afraid to ask questions. Is that a fair assessment? I guess that is fair. I I think the the getting parkland acquisition and having that done the first the first month or so it was like great you know what else what else can i do that long term you know and help out and that one i i do i do consider um a proud proud moment on there of of uh looking back and seeing that i helped get the public what they wanted on there it helped it helped me find my voice i guess is probably the best way to do it and mm-hmm. within that within the group there i don't know looking looking back it's yeah it, it was it was a good one and people come and see me more about what they would like to see. I think I've always taken an approach and this is from as a financial advisor or as an internal consultant. Uh, my, my time at, in Texas is I've always been more of a, a client advisor relationship. And so I've always felt the community was my client. And so um, I've always been trying to be proactive of taking it from their perspective in there. That's, that's what I try to do. All right. So you recently helped write and proposed revisions to the code of ethics for elected officials in Alpharetta. What's the process for addressing something like that? Where do you even start as a baseline for thinking of revisions or things that needed to be added or changed? I think um, I've always, I, I tease everyone. So I, I do a lot more research now that I've lost the remote from uh, my wife and from my, my kids. And, and so I just end up having the computer in front of my face while whatever's playing on TV. <laughs> but, uh, and I, I enjoy seeing what other communities are doing. Um, the catalyst for me where I really started taking a look at it was we, in February, it just came up is that we wanted to reapply for 
a GMA um, code of ethics city. I can't remember the designation on it, okay. but it made me look at the GMA's handbook on it. Georgia Municipal Association. Yeah, okay. Georgia Municipal Association. So all the cities within Georgia mm-hmm. and seeing their templates and then taking it a look at ours. Um, so was ours different? Ours was very different. Okay. How very, so? very different. Um, what, I saw right away was ours was missing a defined process on how to handle a complaint. It was missing uh, definitions of what would be a conflict of interest, uh, what would be a substantial conflict of interest. So not only just yourself, but then your employer, if if it involves your employers, uh, family members, if you're a board member of things, things that just, I think, brings clarity and definition to the process. Um, when there's um, a lack a lack of clarity, it brings uncertainty. I've always found that. So my previous environment, I was in IT, and and as part of that, I was a process manager developing uh, software products for in-house. And I found that also that there was a lot of process documentation in there. So I'm, I've been always very good at researching things there. So saw GMA and saw that there was things that we could add in there that brought clarity. And I think with that clarity brings certainty for our constituents of how, how we're uh, how we're acting as elected officials and as board members. So really all I did it was bring our current code of ethics, added the GMA template, and then a few things in there, like um, if you have a foreseeable interest that you don't have that relationship now, but it, it's pretty reasonable that you will have that relationship, whether you become a contractor or an employee or or any any of those things in there, and that's in the GMA template. Currently. That is, that is not in the GMA template. I found that through my research of looking what other states were doing, okay. like uh, Texas, California, Michigan, and then also Atlanta Code of Ethics. They they have advisories, and they talked about the foreseeable risk. So it's something that was done there. Okay. And then the, the other thing I added was if you're absent in the meeting that you had a conflict of interest, that you would still have to disclose that conflict of interest. And I thought that I thought that was a fair thing to add. Um, what I did then was take that document, take it to Mayor Mitchell for him to, to see. He said it looked good to him. And then I took it to our city attorney, uh, Sam Thomas, and he reviewed it and said it looked good. And, uh, and then I, I presented it to council that I have a right to do. As a council member, you can submit an ordinance and a revision change in there. So everything I've done uh, in there was based on what we had currently, adding in templates there and then adding adding what was done by other uh, municipalities. Okay. So one of the things I find fascinating is a city council is made up of representatives from all different professions. Mm -hmm. Your background is in consulting and financial advising, but we've got uh, real estate, engineering, technology, all sorts of folks on Alpharetta city council. So you're not a lawyer, but you're helping to redefine and reform Alpharetta's code of ethics. And I always find it fascinating when someone who that's not their area of expertise, that's not where their training or their schooling is based out of, they're responsible for making some of these changes. Just mentally speaking, what is your approach like? Who do you consult with? Where do you look for advice on things like that, including and beyond reforming ethics codes in Alpharetta? I think that's a that's a great point. So, as council members, we we have to wade into waters that we don't have any specific training in. But I think mine as a financial advisor, previously a consultant, um, in working in technology uh, for my first my first seven years, it's always been about being able to quickly assess the situation, take notes, find out quickly what you don't know find subject matter experts to or to or research to find the answers and then come up with a solution that that can be agreed upon by as many parties as possible. And so I've been able to do that quite a bit and I, I'm humble enough to know that I don't know a lot of things. So I, I have no problems asking asking staff or asking other people what they think. So I so on the on the code of ethics, I luckily taking the template from GMA was a great start. And then I was able to see we're missing some big things here, whether it's definitions of what a conflict of interest is, whether it was a process, because our current code, it didn't discuss where you would take a complaint to. Mm -hmm. Every other city has it. So you take it to somebody like the city clerk, the city manager or the, or the the mayor. Um, But we had nothing. 
Do you have go-to people or staffers from other cities that you'll reach out to just for advice on things like this? I did a lot of research based on on the Google News and then talking to others, talking to people that um, within the news industry on seeing what their thoughts were. So I try to take a 360-degree view on it. And so I was able to see what, what was done, what happened in the past uh, on there. And someone that was brought up like, well, hey, Milton, Milton and Forsyth County did this. Well, I also know that these other cities did something different or didn't a variation of that or that that wasn't it wasn't necessarily, you know, one in the same or one cause one cause the other. So they did it this way. So there was less less drama. All right. So I want to ask you about that. Okay. So I was talking with Alfreda's sister city, Milton. City Councilman Peyton Jamison yesterday. Okay. And he and I were talking a little bit about this ethics reform, and he said they tried this model where there's a board of citizens who have been appointed to review ethics. Oh, I see. It's a citizen board. They were probably appointed by council members and, and mayors. Right. Yes. And he said that it was a disaster for the city of Milton. You had yeah. ethics complaints for the ethics complaint reviewers, and yeah. it became very political really quickly. How much thought or consideration have you gone into Milton's experience with something like that? And is that a similar concern you might have for Alfreda? I, I did that. And then was it the the board process that caused the drama, or was it just because people were finding you know finding ways to to go through the through the system in there and that's that's what i brought into so i looked at others that's why i I pulled i had it last night i pulled a chart that i looked up all the municipal codes from all the north fulton cities so sandy springs johns creek roswell um ourselves and milton and then forsyth was brought up because they had a similar situation to milton but then i also brought up the atlanta and out of out of all of them four of them i think out of the three we're all resident base. Okay. And then four out of the three, it's, they they were all where it wasn't attorney, because that was the other one. It wasn't just they had to be attorneys. I do not think attorneys have the monopoly on ethics. I think that there's a lot of people in our community that we we would find to be a good judge of what's right or wrong. It's just it's a lot of common sense. And then can you look at the documents in there? So why did you think this was an important issue for the city of Alpharetta to address right now? I think right now was the perfect time between while we're in a period to, uh, between the council that we had and the council that we're about to have to set a playbook together, a rules, rules of how, how we go moving forward. So nothing having to do with what's in the past, but this is what we're doing moving forward. And I wanted to make sure that what I was adding was just adding to the baseline, to the standards that are expected that I, of the Georgia cities, of the GMA. So I understand what, other, what happened in other cities. My point is, is that out of the seven, a majority went with the way the GMA has it. We can always bring it up later on. This is not a binding document. This is a document that should be reviewed and it should grow. And what I can say is out of those seven cities I looked at, we were the only city where there was no defined process of how to handle a complaint. We were the only city that elected officials were the board of ethics. That wasn't right. And so I think it was good to change it now and go moving forward. So the reforms have not been voted on. You you all have had a first reading we, yeah, we had on a, the reform. So right now, if a citizen has a an ethics complaint about a sitting elected official. The elected officials in Alpharetta are the ones to review them. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And we are have so we had our first week of April. We had our first reading this uh, Monday, this past Monday, yesterday, we had our, uh, a workshop where citizens discussed it. We had a good conversation, brought up some of the things that people uh, were bringing up as far as different ways that we can handle the board. And then on April 30th, we'll, we will have our second reading. And then so that'll be voted and then adopted. So after the second reading, the intention is to vote on it and adopt it at that point. Correct. On okay. April 30th. So right now with Mayor Belle Isle moving on to run for Secretary of State and Councilman Chris Owens and Councilman Jim Gelvin resigning to run for mayor in the special election on May 22nd. Council is made up of four officials. You... Councilman Ben Burnett, 
Councilman Dan Merkel, and Acting Mayor Donald Mitchell. According to the Alpharetta City Charter, less than four of you can meet, but it would be almost a pointless. Would this be a workshop meeting. to discuss workshop. more? We could use it because right now we're in a period that traditionally we'd be talking about budget items, seeing what the the staff uh, needs for the next fiscal year, which starts in this July. And then so same, you know, so things can be discussed more. That's on public record. Public can make uh, make their statements known there. So. So who sets the agenda for city council meetings in general? My understanding is that the mayor approves the agenda items, but then any council member with two other ones could add an agenda item or add at a special meeting or like in the case of the ordinance of the code, code of ethics, any council member could submit a code of ethics and that would or an ordinance and that would have to that would have to be on the agenda item to to get approved. And they would submit those items to <clears throat> The mayor and city, city administrator, clerk. city clerk. Yep. Yeah, so Cody. Okay. So between now and May 22nd, what items, when you all are making decisions on what to review as a council of four and what to review till you're a council of seven, what distinctions do you make between deciding what needs to be acted on now and what needs to wait? No distinction for me. I was elected for four years of work and I'm going to work for four years. Um, I'm not going to, under circumstances that we have a special election in May, I didn't decide to have that in May rather than the the previous one in November. Because if we just went through an election cycle and, and there, and then so now going through an election cycle again, that takes off chunks of time during my my four years that I'd like to accomplish things. So, but to be fair, you know, if if it's things that would be binding and long term, I would, you know, I would I would have to think about it a little bit more. But Things that are that are non-binding that can get changed as soon as the council gets on and that they, they want to change, then, then we can't. I have no problem making those decisions now. That's that's what we're here for. So you don't see reforming the code of ethics as binding in the long term? No, because you and on June first, whoever the first meeting in June, they can they can put an ordinance in to say let's let's adjust it and do it and do it this way. That that's why I think all the, the things are are great that people are adding on. Me personally, that's a great point. Me personally, I'd like for us to review other things within the code of ethics. So how how things when they get applied for uh, for through community development that the developer themselves is also verifying that there is no conf- conflict of interest. That we look at our executive meetings and say, okay, is there is there a way that we can have you know within a period of years or months or some time duration that those minutes can be become public? Um, those, those kind of things. I'm I'm really not finished. This is a starting point, and I want to be very clear. This is to put a baseline of the standards that is expected within the cities of Georgia. Okay. And so I I have no problem doing that right now, and that can get changed at the first meeting in June. Okay. Well, I know you're much busier than just helping on uh, reforming the ethics codes here in Alpharetta. <laughs> uh, my understanding is that between you and your three current colleagues on council, you all are staying quite busy. So tell us a little bit just about what are you working on? What do you hope to accomplish in the next couple of years for Alpharetta? As I said, the big, big one was for me is adding park space in there. Now the next, the next logical step is how do we activate the park space? And uh, that takes quite a bit of funds. Uh, so as a liaison to parks and recreation, I've been working, how do we systemize a little bit and schedule our capital projects? We really need to take care of what we have and add that in there as a schedule. So I've been working with finance to have something that's similar to public works where they have X dollars going to stormwater because they know that that repair is needed. Same thing with our, our items, our assets within parks. So making sure the turfs get replaced, making sure new roofs, bathrooms, those kind of thing. But again, as we've had this phenomenal growth from the 90s to, to now, how do we expand to make sure that parks are a 10-minute walk away for everybody? And so that takes that takes a part of the expansion. Luckily, we have what's called the impact fees. So for new development, based on their size and other calculations, that money goes towards things for public safety, parks and recreation, and uh, public works. So how do we how do we utilize prioritize those schedules? We've heard a lot of a lot of different things. In fact, we created a new parks master plan just because between the past three years of our last master plan, we've added new things like the alpha loop, um, the bond, the park, ma- uh, the park bonds. So 
to having the greenway done. So I was like, let's let's create something that we can have a priority of what we're looking at there within parks. Talk to us a little bit about the Alpha Loop. I'm excited about it, but for our listeners who don't know exactly what it's all about, tell them what it is and so, sort of where we're at in that process. Well, I, the Alpha Loop, it's it's something that just happened, I think, last last year. Uh, the vision of let's let's create that a walkable downtown and it's still being defined today i think the inner loop is probably the best uh the thing that's going to happen quickly so what we were naturally having with um alpharetta uh city hall connecting to avalon and and other places within downtown old milt old milton so and and haynes bridge it's a walking trail it's just a walking it's like trail the belt along, line in that sense along the along yeah like the belt line um we're working with a lot of uh, commercial districts, commercial properties to to get easements to create that loop. Um, the outer loop, I'm still still would like to understand more about what that scope would entail. I've learned from a lot of our construction projects to maybe understand the dollars that would be involved before committing to a timeline of when we're going to get this done, and then where where does that fall in to our comprehensive plan in there. I'd like to make sure that we have the money available to uh, to have the greenway, which we have park bond money for. But you know, finish that up, have a good understanding of the construction dollars needed for that to make sure that we're on the mark there, and then also to have a trail system within all of Alpharetta. I think all of Alpharetta deserves that. That you should be able to get to and from walking, and well, that means sidewalks on both sides, um, places, complete streets, so that a bike. A walker, jogger, and cars can all get along together and feel safe. Um, get there. So, Alpha Loop's a great thing, but um, it's it's something that's got to be part of a total trail and mas- trail master plan for all of Alpharetta. So, stay tuned for more. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think that's a good place uh, to wrap up the show. So. Councilman Jason Binder, I want to thank you for being on and uh, filling in the uh, citizens of Alpharetta on what's going on. Sounds good. Thanks, Hans. All righty. This has been the Inside the Box podcast, North Atlanta's number one local podcast. For bonus exclusive content, visit blackboxdocs.com. That's blackboxdocs.com. We welcome your feedback. Email us at pod at blackboxdocs.com.